This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Need to Hone, and it's Wednesday, and that means it's time for another Deck History, the series where I trace the history of prominent Magic the Gathering archetypes from their origins all the way to the current day. As usual, I ran a poll last week to determine the topic of this video, and Madness decks soundly defeated Food decks. Madness is a mechanic that was originally introduced in 2002's Torment. It allows you to pay a cost and cast a card when it gets discarded. This can obviously result in a whole lot of value in the right deck, where you're discarding the cards for other effects anyway, because you end up not really losing the card if you pay for its madness cost. Plus, many cards with madness can be cast for a discount if you end up discarding them. Almost immediately after the mechanic made its debut, it began to play a prominent role in successful competitive decks in multiple formats. For the purposes of this video, I define a deck as a madness deck if several cards with the mechanic played a large role in a particular deck. This includes the more obvious decks like Blue Green Madness and Madness Tong, but we'll also take a look at Hollow One and Bizarre Aggro, as those decks prominently feature cards with the mechanic and they're crucial for their game plan. This means we'll be covering formats like Odyssey Block Constructed, Standard Extended, Legacy, and Vintage. We'll be beginning back in 2002 when Madness decks first emerged in Odyssey Block Constructed. Block Constructed isn't around anymore, but it was a format where only cards from a particular block could be played. A block referred to three consecutive sets that all had the same setting and themes. In this case, those sets were Odyssey, Torment, and Judgment. As I said a moment ago, Madness was a powerful mechanic that made its debut in that block, so it wasn't much of a surprise that Madness decks did incredibly well at Pro Tour Osaka. Ken Ho won the whole event with his Blue Green Madness deck. This was an aggro deck that looked to take advantage of free discard effects and Madness. The deck ran both Aquamoeba and Wild Mongrel, who could hit harder if you discarded cards to their abilities. And when you did discard cards to them, you usually got something pretty great, like a free Basking Rootwalla, a 3-mana 4-4 Trampling Arrogant Worm, or an incredibly cheap counterspell that had special synergy in the deck, in Circular Logic. If you discarded a card to Aquamoeba or Wild Mongrel's abilities, you could effectively flash in the creatures. Madness also combined really well with two other Odyssey block mechanics, Threshold and Flashback. If your graveyard had seven or more cards in it, your Werebear suddenly became a two mana 4-4, four, four, and since you're discarding cards, getting Threshold isn't that hard. Roar of the Worm had a heavily discounted Flashback cost, so discarding it to your Mongrel was often worthwhile, and it felt pretty close to the card just having Madness. As is the case with most block formats, there was only a single Pro Tour where the format was played, but Blue-Green Madness was a powerful enough strategy that decks featuring many of the same cards were able to find success in other formats too. First, let's take a look at the standard version of the deck. Blue-Green Madness was a major force in standard between 2002 and 2003. The first standard event to feature Blue-Green Madness decks in the top eight was Grand Prix Taipei in 2002, where two of the top eight decks were Blue-Green Madness. As you can see, the deck featured many of the same cards, but there are a few differences, which isn't surprising given the larger card pool in Standard. One of these is that the deck doesn't feature Aquamoeba, instead opting to go with Merfolk Looter and Careful Study as Blue Madness Enablers. The deck also features a few other cards that like to be in the graveyard, including Wonder, Ether Burst, and Deep Analysis. Wonder gave your board flying if it was in the graveyard, Ether Burst became more potent the more copies of it there were in graveyards, and Deep Analysis could be cast for a big discount for its flashback cost. Threshold was also still in the deck, but only on Cephalid Colosseum. Obviously enough, using its activated ability was pretty great for the deck, as it could either get value out of cards being in the graveyard, or cast them for their madness cost when they got discarded. Funnily enough, most of these changes were still Odyssey block cards, apart from the looter and a couple of copies of Counterspell. But yeah, this deck had an incredible level of synergy, and that made it very good. Madness decks continued to be successful in Standard throughout 2002, and in 2003, a blue-green Madness deck even finished in the top eight at Worlds. Shortly thereafter, the bulk of the deck rotated out of Standard. As we've seen though, Madness decks were very powerful and synergistic, and this same sort of deck would also find success in Extended. It was a very important deck in that format between 2003 and 2005. Extended is a now-defunct rotating format that featured the last several years of sets, 
so it had a larger card pool than Standard did. However, the deck still looked pretty darn similar to its Standard counterpart, as you can see from Jeff Cunningham's deck that top aided Grand Prix New Orleans in 2003. The deck took on a little more of a control element in Extended, mostly because Days was too good of a counterspell not to play in blue decks. It also had some minor synergy with the discard effects because you could use your Days and still have a card in your hand from the island you returned to it. The deck still really had fast starts involving Root Wallas, Wild Mongrel, and Arrogant Worm. Another important addition to the deck was Waterfront Bouncer, which could simultaneously enable your Madness cards and get a blocker out of the way. Casting a Root Walla for free and bouncing a blocker is pretty awesome. The deck really did not change a whole lot going into 2004 and 2005. There weren't any new Madness cards printed, so there wasn't really anything new to add to the deck. Chrome Mox was really the only notable inclusion from among newer cards, and it allowed the deck to go even faster. In 2005, Blue Green Madness rotated out of Extended, but once again, a version of the deck did manage to live on in another format, Legacy. Although in this case, the success came several years later, and the success it experienced was much shorter lived, really limited to a single top eight in the format. In 2010, Caleb Durward top eighted Grand Prix Columbus with such a deck. This deck doesn't feature nearly as much of the Madness mechanic, but it is certainly a legacy descendant of the decks we've talked about so far, and it has Madness in its name, so it's certainly worth covering. The only card with Madness in the deck is actually Basking Rootwalla, but the deck still uses old standbys like Aquamiba and Wild Mongrel to get value out of putting stuff in the graveyard. In addition to the Rootwalla, the deck also featured Wonder and Vengevine, cards you really wanted to put in the graveyard. One other really sweet aspect of this deck was Survival of the Fittest, a very powerful creature tutor that was also a great discard outlet. That brings an end to the discussion of Blue-Green Madness decks, a deck that really dominated block, standard, and extended, and also found a tiny bit of success in Legacy. Next, I want to talk about Madness Tog, an extended deck from 2005. This was a very Madness-heavy version of Psychotog. I've already done an entire deck history on Psychotog decks, but suffice it to say, there were usually blue-black based control decks that featured the eponymous creature as its win condition. It also just so happens that Psychotog is an excellent madness enabler because he has free discard effects. All version of the deck featured at least a little bit of madness, but Madness Tog was a more aggressive variant that was sort of a fusion of the more controlling Psychotog deck and the blue-green madness deck, running a lot of the cards we've become familiar with already. One notable element of the deck, though, other than Psychotalk, is its use of Dredge cards, Dark Blast, and Life from the Loam. Dredge was another mechanic that worked quite well alongside Madness. While you couldn't cast cards you discarded that had Dredge, you could return them to your hand, so discarding them to something like Psychotalk gave you some real value. That brings an end to this first wave of Madness decks, which came to be pretty impressive in Standard and Extended, and never really ceased being powerful decks in those formats. Rotation is what brought an end to them, no changes in the metagame or anything like that. The second big wave of Madness decks occurred much more recently in Magic history, as in really, really recently, and it's largely a result of a card with Madness that was very recently printed. Blazing Rootwalla, which came out in 2021. This combined with the old school Basking Rootwalla now meant there are two potentially free creatures for Madness decks to take advantage of, and they have become part of two decks in the Eternal formats as a result. Hollow One in Legacy, and Bizarre Aggro in Vintage. These are both decks that existed before Blazing Rootwalla, but the addition of the card has made them significantly better, and it also means they run enough cards with Madness that I think we can call them Madness decks. Let's start with a look at Legacy Hollow One. Hollow One decks get their name from a card, Hollow One, and they are largely based around discarding a bunch of cards so that the Golem can be cast for free. Obviously, this is a strategy that is very good news for cards with Madness, because being able to cast the things you discard means that not only are you getting to cast a free hollow one that turn, you're probably also adding some of the cards you discarded to the board. The deck runs 12 copies of Creatures with Madness between four of each Rootwalla and four Anya's Ravagers, another Madness card from the recent past. While it isn't free like the Rootwallas, it can be a two mana 3-3 three, three that also allows you to discard even more cards, which really plays into the deck's entire strategy, as it can allow you to continue casting things with Madness, making your Hollow Ones cheaper, and then reload your hand with more of those things. In addition to the Madness stuff, the deck also features two other cards you pretty much always want in your graveyard, Anger and Vengevine. Vengevine is very easy to bring back in a deck that casts free creatures by discarding cards, and Anger gives haste to everything, allowing you to get in with your Madness creatures right away. 
The deck's most absurd starts are usually thanks to Lion's Eye Diamond. This deck can largely get around the downside of the diamond by casting the things it discards, which usually also means Venge Vines are coming back, and so forth. One Mana Madness enablers like Putrid Imp, Burning Inquiry, and Faithless Looting also allow for some pretty crazy starts. This deck is a real force in Legacy, and it looks primed for that to continue to be the case. It really has some of the most insane starts of any deck in the format. However, the Vintage Madness deck, Bizarre Aggro, is even more dominant and even more absurd than Legacy Hollow One, which you should probably expect since Vintage has far more utterly busted cards around. As you can see, the deck has a very similar strategy to what we saw in Legacy Hollow One, including a plan based around Root Wallas, Hollow One, and Venge Vine. However, in Vintage, there is an absolutely absurd enabler, Bazaar of Baghdad. This powerful land might not produce mana, but it does allow you to discard a whole bunch of cards for no mana at all, and even reloads your hand a little bit. Basically, the Bazaar enables even more consistent insane starts than are possible in Legacy. A pretty typical start for the deck involves playing Bazaar on turn 1 and tapping it to discard some combination of the two Root Wallas and Avenge Vine. If you do that, you get two Root Wallas and Avenge Vine into play for free, and you can also cast Hollow One for free if it's in your hand. Even in a format as powerful as Vintage, that's the kind of start that is very difficult to beat, and Madness plays a pretty large role in making it happen. So, that's a history of Madness decks. Blue-Green Madness dominated Magic's tournament scene between about 2002 and 2005, and over the last year or so, Madness-heavy decks have also emerged in Legacy and Vintage, and they're quite powerful. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future deck histories, you should subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on the over 25 other episodes of Deck History, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can on Patreon. Thanks for watching.